and this is happening at a time when a lot of persons are looking at the government yes. for improved wages a lot of persons are looking at employment opportunities yeah. in either the federal or civil service and even the private sector is looking at some of the salaries that most nigerians are not comfortable with yeah. this has pushed young persons to say you know what i can be an entrepreneur yeah. i can do this i can do that but in finding that space much like you discovered yourself yeah. What are some tools that persons can deploy to harness their innate abilities? Um, for I've, I've realized over time that not many people can self-discover. Um, that's opposed to me. And sadly, even though I'm, I mean, I'm a great as a lecturer side, and sadly is that we have the primary place where they ought to, which is education. If you go back to the etymology of education, it means to bring out. And so it means that what education is supposed to do for us is to bring out the inner potentials in every individual, but we don't have that. And so it means that the first place an individual should start is self-discovery, finding out what your passions are, finding out what interests you. I, I'm a person who believes that no human being is lazy. It's just that um, he does not like to do what you want him to do. Find, give the person something he's genuinely passionate about, you would see him with the entire zest to make it happen. And so many a times the world is impatient for people who are slow towards self-discovery. And so if the person can first understand, understanding oneself is you have solved the problem more than half of it, I believe so. And so if you can sit with yourself and find out what genuinely am I passionate about, once you have that, acquire the right knowledge around that space, which is a thing I think we, this part of the world lacks, which is we're not data driven. And so you need the right data, the right amount of data, even though of course we have that on an infrastructural side that data is not easily accessible because we don't keep data as a record. But as much as possible, try to get the right data around, this is what I'm passionate about. What are the availabilities? What are the institutional voids that exist within this space? And how can I play in? Juxtapose that to what are the skills, potentials, talents, my own A game, more like you're doing a SWOT analysis, analysis of your yeah. own self, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and threats that, that you have towards what it is you want to do. And so if you do that properly, sit down, one, two, the right relationships. We live in a, permit to use a social economy. You need the right networks and the right people. So if you have those relationships, and I divide relationship into the people you look, persons you look up to. So there's nothing new under the sun. So it means that whatever it is, no matter how your USP might sound, no matter what career path you think you're going into, there are people who have gone ahead of you and have at least tr have tried to make that happen. Look for those people. If you can get closer to them, fine. If you can't, study them, go through it. I did, I mean, I just believe we need to love to learn. We need to love to seek. We need to be inquisitive. There's no extreme to your inquisitiveness, which I think is a thing that we, the African culture killed in children. When a child is growing up and is asking questions, they'll just shut you up. But if we allow that space, that enabling environment for people to genuinely be inquisitive towards the path of self-discovery and understanding themselves, the space they want to be in, the potentials they have, as well as seeking the right networks as to who have gone before me, let me read about them, what are they doing, how did they get there? Peers within your own space, who also have that same passion or similar what are they doing to aid their own development aid their own growth achieve their own goals and there are others who are coming behind you as well who somewhat are also looking up to you in one way or the, or the other there's a perspective from there that you can learn based of the difference within generations alone means that there is a different approach that a generation below you will take towards what you're doing it is important that you don't go out entirely from them so learn from their own how do they see this thing that they're doing because at the end of the day they are the people you want to serve and so if you gather this in terms of knowledge self-discovery right relationships and networks and learning from that i think you've solved majority of the problem the next thing left for you is action and so just take that action no matter how small it is start where you are and start small now, you also highlighted the African culture, yeah. one that has been overly perceived as not allowing for inclusivity in young persons. Yes. But now, when you say education, especially with the epidemiology of learning on ethnic yeah. potential, let's come from the informal aspects. Right. Here in Nigeria, we have a certain culture amongst the Southeasterners, yes. particularly the Igbos, yes. 
who believe in mentorship through skill acquisition they call it mwa boy yes where young persons learn from thriving entrepreneurs yes they spend time on the studying and mastering the act of business whilst largely our generation is delving more towards the formal education yes those persons continue to thrive in their stead okay. how do we on one hand marry this culture that at least gives room for traditional mentorship yes and a new modernized education that looks at mentorship from a more informed and decorated perspective. And so um, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm, you are also aware that even the Ivy League schools are already taking that into their own education system and learning it. It has been said that that's the best method for entrepreneurship. If any nation wants to have entrepreneurship at its best, the Noir boys system is the best and they study it so you have the likes even netflix recently released the apprenticeship and all of that so there is somewhat of media and noise around that which goes to show even even in the formal sector it is there um no man we have we've had i mean it has been abused you hear the godfatherism in politics you hear oh this is my mentor this is my father in the state and so in silently it is there it is a system that exists um, permit me to use even the Bible says the less is blessed of the greater. So generally, it means that it is inculcated into the fabrics of ourselves as human beings. We need the Father, permit me to use the word, to direct you. So train up in the child in the way he should go when he's not. And so I think that we need to one accept it in terms of being aware that this is it, and being aware makes it that it comes to our consciousness that this is what I'm doing, meaning. The Igbo people, the person who brings the guy to his house is conscious of this is what this guy is coming in to do. There's a clear-cut goal and objective. In the formal structure, we generally just generalize it. That's one. Two, there is the specificity to what this person is going to learn. And there is a system and a structure. This is what I mean. When he comes, there is a, and even aside of the man who brought him, Within the other boys that have been, he knows that this guy is a level ahead of me. The next, it takes me some couple of years. That structure also needs to be placed within the formal system to say as little as group works. Um, there is a group leader for group works. We need to be able to say that the essence of this is, and so most times I do it when I want to lecture. This is my topic for this semester. And I break it down into every day I'm entering my classroom. What do I want them to go that is towards achieving the overall goal of the course itself? And how do I ensure that people learn within themselves by interrelationships? And so you bring them into groups. It is my responsibility to know my students. So I know every student in my class, their strengths, their weaknesses, which informs how I put them into groups and say, okay, you be the leader. And design thinking approach is one of the best methods to do it. If you are looking for, let's say, a proper formal way to inculcate this into the formal system, is the design thinking approach, which is simply saying, let's do problem solving that is customer centric at the end of the day. And so you have to break people into groups and leadership takes turns and let everybody give out of his own self. With that, what you have is people are learning with a set clear goals, which we generally don't have. We just have someone who goes and I studied mass comp. At the end of the day, at what point in time do I say, I want to know what part of this broad mass communication that I studied do you want to learn? And at what point do I introduce you to that over time? We're trying as government in the initiative of saying, in 200 level, everybody should study entrepreneurship. But that's general. That's not specific. It is great work. I understand the problems and challenges that might come into that. But I'm saying, if... There's a buy-in from everybody within the formal education sector, from primary, secondary, to tertiary level, to saying that let's create a system where students learn with a specific goal in front. And that goal is inculcating skills and not give you a theoretical-based information and expect you to give me back another theoretical base. Where if I said, if I divine it as data is this, this, and you don't divine it, you are wrong. No. The end of the goal is what I want you to learn. Whatever form you give it out, the, have you gotten what I want you to get? Yes. So that's for me is what I mean by break it down. Let's not generalize it. Let's be able to say this is the clear-cut objectives that I want to achieve. 
and how can we ensure there's a buy-in from everybody inculcating international interpersonal relationships within themselves collaborations networking and see them grow and monitor that as opposed to how we run things right now the likes of singapore finland and even japan are already introducing it in the educational system where you have kids in nursery primary school just play and just let's see you relate and we will know what to guide you through and so it's a thing the world ahead of us developed nations have gone ahead it's just us here that are yet to inculcate that and if we can and of course not a one size fits for us but to us as africans how can we make this work for us by us i think that that's the best way we can now we're looking at a current administration yeah. that has shown dedication to overhauling our current education system yeah First, there have been debates in certain quarters that the 6334 oh. education system needs to be rejected, beyond yeah. which is even access to be able to pay for higher education. Yeah. Now, there's a student's loan scheme on ground that says, you know what, beyond colleges of education and universities, let us see vocational skill centers also afford young Nigerians yeah. the opportunity to imbibe core skills and competence. What do you make of this development as one? And are there any ways that it can improve, be improved upon in terms of rejigging our security uh, education curriculum um in terms of what i make of it sincerely i would say it's just the same nigeria that we've been since obi was education minister she's been shouting on that and we've gone back and forth with it that has been changed we went back to the same thing i think that primarily what would have a problem with is the content of our curriculum not necessarily how we run it whether 6344 or 933 is the content of it that needs to be checked that's one and which brings it me to answering the question of what do i think can be modernized or improved upon to enhance that um there needs to be a general buy-in from every stakeholder government and private to be particular um, on the government side it means that creating the right policies that enable for that to happen um for the likes of things are going up um we have a generation that self-led um, we have gone at these days where, I mean, we've left from parents being the educators to teachers, and now it's media. So it means that everybody is fighting for attention. And so even the teacher in the classroom is fighting for the student's attention with his Netflix, with his social media. Attention is the main thing. And so if the, that's why I said there's a buy from every side. If the private sector can also, particularly people who are innovators or founders, trying to create ed tech um, startups to be able to cater for that, and ensure that one of the primary things we need towards innovation and improving our economy is an informed. You can't give out what you don't have. So it means that the reason why we are still like this is that primarily we have a knowledge gap. Whether there are people, of course, there are those who have done exceedingly well, but when you take a mass, there's a mass knowledge gap that needs to be final. As how we are seeing an inclusion of those who aren't included in the financial services. I think we need to take that same step towards the education sector, which is, on the government side, create a proper policy and a system around that. As regards just waking up and bringing bills, yes, for instance, the IDs, um, investments in digital economy and creative enterprises, the Nigerian Youth Innovation Innovative Fund, Investment Fund, all of that are good and applaudable things, but they don't trickle it down to the end. And that's what I'm saying. Let's pick our curriculum and content-wise change it. How do we, what are the new skills that need to be embedded? How, what are the new learning methods that are available? What are the new learning outcomes? What is expected globally? Can our six-year-old in Nigeria compete with a six-year-old in Japan? If that is not possible, it means that we need to change that because the world is a globalized place. And so it means that we are one village. So there's the same expectation of the six-year-old in Japan that the American is having is the same expectation he should have on the Nigerian. So let's not think as in a box in our own rock that we are in. Let's think outside. We are competing not with Nigerians, we are competing with the world. And so if our curriculum cannot match that, we need to change. Bear in mind that every change I'll be saying is that we need to change using ourselves, using our own methods, right? The same thing for all levels of the education. The graduate of entrepreneurship, the graduate of mass communication. Can he compete with the fellow graduate of mass communication in another place? That is what, what are the skills that the person who is graduating would have that ours don't have? Let's bring come back there. As simple as, I remember my first undergraduate thesis when I was in math 
was around a decision tree diagram for the level of experience a student should have by the time he's graduating. As we all know in Nigeria, you are graduating after NYC and someone is asking you for a ridiculous three years of working experience. Where do you want to get it? But it's not the person's fault because he's seeing that abroad, the graduate has that experience, but we don't. And so, but how do they? It is that if you have friends who are abroad who are studying, they are three months, six months break. They use it for internships, but we don't have that here. Can we inculcate that into our system and say, it is part of the grading system where between your 100 level and your 200 level break, three months break that you have, go and do an intern, internship in so so and so place related to this. And this is the outcome we want you to learn. Meaning there is a buy-in from even the companies that will, that will take you in and say, these interns that are coming. So for instance, let's say, let's pick Mascom. 100 level, what the core you learned was journalism. So look for a place to go and be a journalist or a reporter. So these interns that are coming, you are going to underscore this reporter or you are going to under, understudy this particular person. And we come back, we get a feedback. In 200 level, is a different ballgame mentality. If we inculcate these little things into our systems, the same thing for the accountant. What do you, you are learning balance sheets, bookkeeping, what businesses are available, go and prepare the books. For universities that already have enterprises within, are the students open to learning and working with those enterprises to learn how to keep the books? Practical skills are not just someone who open open to page 84 and let's do this. And that's all you know. Go into it. See what drawings means. See what it means that debit, oh, if, if you collect a loan, it is credit. If it's learn it, see it being played and how it affects the business as a whole. How it affects strategic decisions. If we can break that down for every of our courses that we learn in the university, I think we've gone a long way to practicalizing this into our curriculum. A very, in closing, the very thing I would say is, I remember my, the first time I stepped into Covenant University to study information and communications technology. I was entering and the 400 level student who was meeting with the teacher for their, for their project, they asked, the teacher asked a simple question, which was, I want you to go back and hold your handset, your, hand, your mobile device. And tell me what you wish that device is doing that is not currently doing. And go and build that. And that's your project. I'm studying information. Everybody then in management science had to learn AutoCAD. As you might not see the need of it, but it prepared their student for the digital and technology age that is coming. So those little things need to be put into our curriculum to make this thing a proper structure that we can compete to an innovation, innovative world in which we exist in today. Now, having listened to you, but stress the need for enhanced frameworks that will better our curriculum yes. and in turn improve the quality of graduates we churn out yes. in the hindsight that yes. it is about global competitiveness. Yes. Now we're in a world where we're importing human capital from other nations. Yes. Here in Nigeria, we have expatriates coming who are more or less the most experienced persons, even when it comes to infrastructural development, mm -hmm. road construction, architecture and whatnot. Yeah. We now ask the question of ourselves as Nigerians. Yes. What type of human capital development can Nigerians export? People will point to the entertainment scenes. People mm. will point to the sporting scenes and say, some Nigerians are the best in other countries, representing even other nationalities. Yeah. If you look at football, yeah. the likes of Bukayo Saka and whatnot. But overall, in arching this, this discussion, yeah. what is one sector you think that Nigerians can, as a government, mm. private sector, look into to begin to export human capital from that sector on the global stage nobody needed at least if you are not a gen z nobody needed to everybody had an opportunity to be a farmer across either your mom had a garden for vegetables or it was on a large scale agriculture is embedded in the african man's blood if you grow it so i think that that's one place that we need to properly look into and harness and export of course, we might say we don't have the technical, the technology aspect of it. But what it means is that we understand the soil more than anybody else. We understand the climate and the needs for crops and setting crops to grow. That knowledge can't be taken away from you. Um, you know how to rear the animals. In, you, it's just inborn. You didn't, you didn't learn it from anywhere. That is a sector that I think has been probably neglected in terms of consciousness towards growth for that and not necessarily in terms of policies but in terms of can we consciously take this and say let's leave oil the same thing we did in entertainment i mean we loved folk tales we it's because of how we grew as 
as be, every boy played soccer at one point. So it means that let's go back to the things that was general and normal. And one of that aside, entertainment and sport is agriculture. So if we sit down with that and proper, properly harness it by private and government sector, I think we have another form of human capital export that we can give. Now, we'll now look at the deployment of innovation. Yes. Now, whilst we have looked at agriculture as some would say in hindsight, a mainstay that has been neglected, yes. we're now seeing innovation coming to bear and at most of the overarching outputs we have as a people yes it is being able to bring it into mainstream mm -hmm. deploying technology at hand with increased media awareness yes. now we're seeing young nigerians carving niches for themselves as content creators yes. before now in the last decade i doubt if you had told any nigerian parent or guardian mm. i want to delve into content creation they would look at you as having a future yeah but now we're seeing uh, a parentage that is welcoming the idea sure. do you think that on the part of government and private individuals this can receive more attention and investments that's for content great you know yes it can but um at what level can it be primarily because we still have a should i say almost a pseudo lack of structure around media itself i agree and so um trying to formalize that would somewhat be difficult so things grow based on the proper infrastructure macro on a macro level even on the macro level government can say let's harness this the same way they are trying to get a buy-in and all in into entertainment as a one segment if they can do that holistically as the covering body media as a whole media and entertainment I think that through that, if you trickle it down, it would you'll be able to draw in every fruit that's on the tree, which of the, at the end of the day will affect the content creation side of things. Uh, so from in terms of ensuring that, yes, is there a right to protecting for the content creators themselves? Um, how, what can we use to measure what is, in, what is inventive for them? How can we assess that? What body is there to play? That's one. Two, it's also important to know that at the end of the day, there is a need for structure. What do I mean? Even the content creators aren't getting paid compared to their other counterparts outside the country. And that is on a national level. It is not a fault of theirs. It means that the government needs to also look at that and say, okay, what is making that we're not earning from TikTok as how other people should? Because we need the inflows of, 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 of that also to help ensure our economy grows or well, can we create that structure rather than having the news that we are having meta is reducing their, their their employees in their lagos office or moving their office away how can we ensure that these are com these um companies in themselves have a buy-in from us because it's important to know that we have the population to compete globally but it means that structural on a macro level there is still a need for government to sit down and i also think that um, plus to what she's doing our minister of youth development around the digital and creative economy space um a proper sit down needs to happen around let's look at things holistically and see where we need to tighten what policies we need to put in place and what in, what structure and infrastructure needs to be built that this will can build upon successfully going forward